Mother of history, an old adage, and nowhere is this more apparent than in the northeast of North America during the 17th and 18th century, with the British colonies of southern New England and New York separated from the French colonies along the St. Lawrence by a howling wilderness and extremely rugged terrain, including the Adirondacks and the Green Mountains. Now, the way to get through this howling wilderness was a series of waterways, starting with the St. Lawrence Seaway and then at Sorel, moving up the Richelieu River, which moves through a series of riffles and runs toward Lake Champlain. If you were to take this trip today, you would find that you were marching through or canoeing through a very fertile area historically with Ile aux Noix being one of the hallmark areas to visit, the home of a great Revolutionary War fort and cemetery. If you were continuing along South of Ile aux Noix, you would come to Lake Champlain. And moving by Isle Motte, you'd come to Cumberland Head, and off to your right would be Plattsburgh, New York, the site of a great battle in 1814, Valcour Island, the site of a great battle in 1776. Moving through the body of Lake Champlain, you'd come to Split Rock, where Lake Champlain makes a quick westward jog, and then straightens out again and as you moved along you'd go by Arnold's Bay where in 76 Arnold burned the remains of his fleet after the Battle of Alcour Island and finally you would come to the great forts at Crown Point. Now there are two forts that are visible there if you should ever happen to visit. The smaller being Fort St. Frederick made of stone from which the French sent so many mischievous attacks against the English in the 18th century and the larger being constructed by Lord Geoffrey Amherst in his campaign against Montreal in 1759 and 1760. Beyond Crown Point, down the lake you go and the lake turns muddy in this region until you come to Ticonderoga, where a French fort was built called Carillon in 1758. Ticonderoga being a very important area because it is where the La Chute River spills in from Lake George. If you were to portage a canoe or small bateau up the La Chute River, you'd come to the beautiful clear waters of Lake George and maybe 15 miles south, Sabbath Day Point, which is a great spot to make camp. Moving down the lake, you go through two sets of islands known as the Narrows until finally at the southern end of the lake you come to Fort William Henry which was constructed by Sir William Johnson in 1755, the site of so much action during the Great French and Indian War between 1754 and 1763. From southern Lake George you can portage a canoe down what is now Route 9 New York to Glens Falls, and guess what? You're on the Hudson. And at Glens Falls, you had the great camp that was built uh, in the Great French and Indian War in 1755, 6, 7, 8. Rogers Rangers was known to have their major camp in that region. And heading down the Hudson toward New York City now, you're gonna go by Bemis Heights and Stillwater where the great Battle of Saratoga was fought in the American Revolution. You'll continue down the Hudson by so many awesome historic sites like West Point until you will eventually come to the city of New York, the Big Apple, and Manhattan Island. Now remember, in the 18th century, Manhattan Island was mostly pasture and garden plots with the city of New York at the extreme southern end. Now what I've just shown you 
is the natural invasion route between the English colonies and later the American states and Canada, initially controlled by the French, but later kept by the British. There is a second line of attack, however, at the southern end of Lake George. If you don't want to go down Lake George, you can stay on Lake Champlain until you get to South Bay, where today you'll find the town of Whitehall, which was once known as Skeensboro, and move down the Wood Creek to Glens Falls. But this is, once upon a time, a battleground. And now a great mm -hmm. place to catch fish of all Look sorts. at you. Beautiful. That's probably harder than my four pounder. Drag. Keep them up. Keep them up. Get hit, lift, lift your pole up. Lift your pole up. All right, can we net this? No. It's huge. It's not huge. It's mega. It's bring it over here so I can grab it. It's mega. Now see, I'm not grabbing the line. I'm taking it real easy. Lake Champlain. Oh my god. It's getting drifted by the uh, surfing. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I lift that. That's like a three, two and a half, three. Oh, he's doing what they do. Nothing, nothing outrageous, but. And I'm looking for a pattern, you know. This lake has got so many fish in it. The secret is, to, once upon a time, this bay was called Vigorous Bay. But on October 13th, 1776, from the north, and that would be right over here, Benedict Arnold's much depleted fleet, chased by the full British fleet with the, oh, missed one. Fishing Historic Places is in Coal Bay, where on that island, in the mid-1630s, Isaac Jogues was martyred by Mohawk, who had captured him for a second time. Smallmouth here. Not a huge one, but not a bad one. They get near the boat, they get crazy. I'm a fan of grabbing the spinner bait itself or the lure. Little chunker. Back in the water. Nice. Look at that. Right in the corner of the mouth. Yes. Let me see that pig. Oh, yeah. That's what you like right there. That's what you like to see. Oh, he's a little fatty. Mm-hmm. You're going to get off. Oh, no, he didn't. He ain't going to get off now. He's coming in. Mm. Mm. He opened his big old mouth. Out. Imagine Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold coming down the Vermont shore in 75 May. They look across that sleeping Fort Ticonderoga. We've got about 400 men. They're only about 30, about 100 of them across when the sun starts to rise. And they will appear at the gate, surprising a guard who was able to point and pull the trigger of his brown bass musket. Aimed into Arnold's chest. However, it was a simple flash in the pan. The main charge didn't ignite. Ethan Allen lays one of those ham-like fists into the sentry's jaw, and down he goes like a felled ox. At which point, Arnold and Allen 
jostling each other to get to the officers' quarters first, encounter a British lieutenant. In the name of God and the Continental Congress, surrender this fort, says Benedict Arnold to the lieutenant, who says, I, sir, I'm just a lieutenant. I have no right to defend the fort. I have to talk to the captain. So at that point, Arnold and Alan jostle their way to the captain's quarters. They knock on the door. There's only a company of British soldiers stationed guarding the most powerful fort that the British have south of Quebec. Banging on the door, the captain comes pulling up his breeches, and Ethan Arnold, I mean Ethan, <laughs> Ethan Arnold, Ethan Allen will repeat Arnold's earlier cry, but a little different, in the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress, surrender this fort, which the captain did. Oh, I'm surprised how the day he's got a girl on, stand man, got a big large mouth. Oh, <laughs> get the head in, get the head in. There we go. The guy guy. Look at me. I got Mr. Largemouth snagged. I snagged him. He made the mistake of hitting me. And he got snagged. Now, of course, you can't snag a fish. It's illegal. Um, but he hit it, obviously, and Tom's got to go. Watch those teeth. Yeah. Okay, there's a nice large mouth right here. We're Yep. Yeah. yeah. Pose for the picture. What's cool about these guys is they are split. They're like slimeless. The guy has no slime. And get them right out in the sun. Oh, yeah. So, Tom Price with the Fishing Historic Places crew is using, oh, you spit out a big piece of smelt. It's using the unthinkable. This is, there it is, there we are. You can see Tom has decided to break all the rules. I'm throwing spinner baits, I'm catching fish, but Tom decides to start throwing. Yes, you're right. <laughs> spinners. Now, he started doing this a couple years ago at Lake George because it they work pretty well sometimes if you jig them. So, what he's done is <laughs> he's got this new technique that nobody does. Look at the size of this fish that Officer Price has pulled in here. Tom, hold your fish. Unbelievable. Price is right again. That was his nickname years ago. He's basically pioneering something that nobody does. Nobody. I mean, <laughs> that, that fish hit, uh, what would that be, a quarter ounce rooster tail? Yep. Unbelievable. And this is not... I think I follow, I think I yeah, but he's still a pretty good fish. like yank and drag big time. Yeah. yeah, he's not a bad one. He's like a three, three and a half, I think. But he is kind of caught it's under the side, head. Yeah, yeah. That's, what I'm saying. that's why I'm definitely trying to pull. This. No, he doesn't care. like more like three and a half four. nice fish get a picture of that beautiful
you're getting way too close to the end of your pole. You're like two feet away. Six feet of line. Then you can just reach down and grab it. Nice smallmouth. Oh, that's a hog. <laughs> He can't help himself. He's got the belly thing going. The belly is good. I like it. Like you said, just don't move it. Yeah, just a just a rotten old stinko. The only thing I'm doing different is I'm. Yeah, and I'm wacky rigging it, but I don't wacky rig it the way a lot of people do. I, I'm yeah, using like a, a circle. I'm using a circle hook, yeah. and um, I come up. Hello. I would have you do it, Nickelodeon, but I'm worried. See the circle hook. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. The circle hook almost always if you if you don't set the hook, you just kind of reel it. Yeah. It'll get them right in the corner of the mouth. It's such a great. Is that a circle or is that like an octopus? Hook? This is a circle. Okay. Well, it's an well, it's a refined circle. They call it an octopus. Yeah. You're right. Meets and oh, he gets spit. Oh, he still. <laughs> How do you? Mason, did did we the hook? Fighting. Yeah, you're gonna put him into the motor, Mason. Keith Mason on fishing historic places. Look at him. He just lines it. He's like the laziest lip guy I've ever seen in my life. I don't know. I gotta keep it out of the weeds. We know there's a lot of weeds here. I, I got him in the weeds now. I can feel it. I don't know what we got. I'm hoping it's a pike. Damn large mouths. They suck. Well, he's hitting, he's hitting his spinnerbait. That's good. Large mouth. Yeah. On a spinnerbait. Nice fish. Their shoulders are Nice fish. Nickelodeon. Oh, Mr. Pickerel. Can't win here. No, I got him. It's just a spinner bait. No! Oh. Oh, these nasty teeth. Me and my dad call them slime rockets. Yeah, they are.
the large mouth. That was a great hit. Smallmouth, I think. You told him to burn it, and then he. Hold it out so we can see. Nickelodeon, hold it out so I can see it with the camera. All right, a little bit of weedage. I got one. Whoa, nice small mouth. Look at this small mouth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jake's like, what am I going to do? Huh? Look at this. Look at that smallmouth. Not like yours, Jake, but still a nice one. That's a nice one. A little fatty. Well burned spinner bait. He was where he was supposed to be. A little bit of wind started. The second the wind started, the spinner bait produced. What are we looking at? Large mouth. I can't think of too many places that provide the opportunities that Lake Champlain does for what we like to do on Fish in Historic Places, which is catch just about everything that swims in the Northeast and explore history. We're talking about everything from the history of the native peoples right through the wars of the imperial powers of England and France, and finally up into the American Revolution and the War of 1812. I mean, naval battles were fought on this massive lake, which just happens to be a bass factory, a multi-stage, multi-story fishery with some of the best nursery areas that you can imagine for young fish. And it's a place I just can't wait to get to every summer. Lake Champlain, it's made for fishing historic places.